Africa. So it's a privilege and honor to invite a fellow South African and alma mater, Dr. Stavros uh, Nicolau. Uh, Stavros, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hitesh. Uh, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure uh, to be on this panel with you uh, and certainly for me to share some thoughts. Uh, of course, these thoughts are all shared in the interest of uh, how, how do we assist to capacitate the continent uh, further? How do we get the continent to solve local public health issues without the dependency of the rest of the world? And I know that these are topics that we've been discussing for some time now, but I think what is uh, I, I don't want to quote uh, Harold Macmillan by, uh, on this occasion, but I am going to borrow his, um, one of his quotes, which is uh, the winds of change. And I have detected for the first time in the midst of this crisis that the world has faced and the crisis that our continent has faced, I've detected a renewed interest and the winds are indeed changing for Africans to take control of their own local situations, to have local capacity solving their own local public health issues. So if I've got to look at any silver linings, and they're not too many, unfortunately, because we've all uh, been party to and witnessed for 21 months now, uh, the devastating impact of the pandemic, both on lives and livelihoods. So certainly uh, one does look for, for silver linings, and I think for me, both the biggest lesson and also the most profound silver lining has been that uh, Africa has said to itself, we cannot rely on the rest of the world, unfortunately. We all know about the solidarity that uh, you know, pervaded all of the discussions in, in January and February last year when the world was coming to terms with what the uh, next 12 month pandemic outlook might be. So there was a lot said about solidarity, but we know that in reality and practice, we've seen the reverse. So this has been a hard lesson for Africa, but also a big wake up call, I believe. And uh, it's been so pleasing to see how uh, African leadership has come to the forefront. Uh, Africa has fought for its space and Africa is looking to solve its own problems. Now I want to preface my talk this afternoon uh, by stating something that is rather obvious, but it's, it's rather profound as well in the context of the conversations that we've had in the last uh, two days on, on this platform. And that is, of course, Africa has the most disproportionate disease burden of, of any continent in the world. Uh, I think most people sitting outside of Africa will say to you, but you only kind of have uh, infectious diseases. Well, that's not true. In fact, we've got a quadruple burden of disease uh, in Africa, characterized by a rising tide of non-communicable diseases. And unfortunately and regrettably, uh, one of the manifestations of this pandemic in Africa and elsewhere in the world is that we've channeled most of our resources and capacity towards COVID and neglected many of the other chronic diseases, uh, such as diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and many others. And of course, um, we know that those patients that are comorbid with some of these non-communicable diseases are the patients that don't do particularly well when they're infected with, uh, with COVID. So we've kind of seen this crossover effect between a, a new pandemic uh, that is leading or giving rise to a future pandemic, which could be the exacerbation of non-communicable diseases on the continent. So, so, you know, we talk about the next pandemic, and there will no doubt be pandemics as there have been throughout history, either pandemics or regional epidemics. We've, uh, we've kind of experienced these every decade or so on the African continent, uh, hard to predict when we might see the next one. But uh, if I were a betting man right now, I would say that the next pandemic is the rising tide of unmanaged communicable diseases on the continent. 
So why am I raising this, Chitesh? I'm raising this because when we engage in these conversations about building local capacity on the continent, we, we shouldn't be uh, focused in the vaccine space only. Vaccines are the immediate priority, of course, because we've got the here and now that we need to deal with. But there's a broader challenge that the continent needs to surmount. And this is the time to transcend that broader challenge. What is that challenge? Very simply and bluntly put, is that for a continent that has the most disproportionate disease burden of any continent in the world, it is the continent that is also a chronic and serial importer of medicines, medical equipment, and vaccines. A wholly unacceptable position to be in. It's, it's tantamount to saying that you have got the biggest consumers of cars in the world, but yet you're importing all the cars because you're not making them in your own country. It's, it's counterintuitive. And that needs to change. And as I said, the winds of change are blowing over Africa. I'm seeing for the first time a strong commitment uh, towards taking this localization agenda, the local procurement agenda, taking it seriously on the continent. And uh, there, there are a number of torchbearers in this area. Um, it, it probably started with President Cyril Ramaphosa when he was the African Union uh, chairman last year in 2020. Uh, coincidentally, the same time uh, that he assumed office was the same time that the uh, pandemic started, um, started moving south into our continent. And um, he was probably the first torchbearer of uh, creating or establishing local capacity on the continent so that we could uh, respond appropriately to this and any future pandemic. And then, of course, there are many other individuals. I'm not going to mention all of them by name. I'm mentioning these torchbearers because it's part of this new ethos that I'm seeing on the continent. So some of the others are Dr. John and Keda Song, who unfortunately will be moving to PEDFAR in the next three weeks or so. Um, in his capacity as director of Africa CDC, been a tremendous torchbearer, as has uh, Strav Masiwa, who is the African Union Special Envoy for uh, COVID and also the head of Abbott. So these are just three of the torchbearers. Now, why am I even raising torchbearers? I'm raising torchbearers because we need many more torchbearers to implement the plan that we need to, to localize the continent or localize pharmaceutical capacity on the continent. So let me share some of our Aspen experiences in this regard. And I'm deliberately not talking only about infectious diseases or viruses or bacteria for that matter. I'm talking generally because when you've got a quadruple burden of disease and a quadruple burden is the infectious diseases the non-communicable diseases. And, and then you've got um, things like uh, GBV on the continent and those areas. And then finally, you've got uh, some of the... Uh, more westernized diseases that are typically non-communicable diseases but are largely inaccessible to treatment right now. So things like oncology, for example. So that's when I talk about a quadruple word and that's what I mean. So the Aspen example. Aspen is a fairly young company. We are, we are 24 years old. Um, we established our business in South Africa. We have our roots still very firmly entrenched, rooted in Africa. And we had no intentions at the onset of um, building a global business model. In fact, we were kind of more interested in, um, we were more interested at the time in having a regional consumer, pharmaceutical consumer type of business, where one thing led to another. And uh, we uh, realized through an underpinned manufacturing strategy that we could go global. And now we are a true South African multinational, probably the most globalized South African company with a 
an active market presence in uh, 60 markets and also uh, sell our products in 150 markets globally. So how did we arrive at that point? And I'm gonna speak a little to the non-communicable diseases because I don't want us to lose sight in this whole localization project and this re-enthused local procurement initiative that we're looking to pursue on a continent and uh, reducing the import bias and solving our own problems. I don't want us to lose sight of some of the other conditions. You know, one doesn't want to solve for A and then sort of it's like a balloon and it pops out on the other side of B. Right? So what are some of uh, the areas that Aspen looked at at the time very early on? Um, when we, uh, close to when we were established, we started coming to terms in the early 2000s with the HIV pandemic on the continent. And we sat back as a management team and we said, but, you know, can we sit by and watch all this ravaging that's taking place? In those days in South Africa, 350,000 South Africans were perishing on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. And we realized that those that were demising were actually your younger population groups. In other words, your future economic, uh, economically active population. And that posed a real social, economic, and political risk to the country. So we said somehow we've got to get involved. And um, what drove the point home for us is, is, is in 2000, former President Mandela asked us to sponsor a clinic near his ancestral home. And in sponsoring that clinic, we realized that 80% plus of the patients that were presenting were HIV positive. And they had very little or no prospect. All intents and purposes, these were patients on death row waiting for the executioner to come. And we also realized that antiretrovirals were available globally, but not in our own country because of the price tag. Cut a long story short, we were able to secure voluntary licenses to produce these, uh, these antiretrovirals. We pioneered the first African generic antiretrovirals, reduced the price tag from $5,000 per patient per year down to $180 per patient per year. This was done through voluntary licenses, sitting across the table, multiple stakeholders, particularly with those that own the intellectual property. And there's a compelling reason why they would want to enter into these type of arrangements. So, the intellectual property debate is not a new debate. It's a debate that came to the fore in the early 2000s, so almost 20 years ago. And we're kind of recycling that conversation all over again. What was the lesson then? The lesson was that voluntary licenses work best in terms of getting product to market with speed, but also giving access to treatment where it's previously inaccessible. Just getting an intellectual property on its own doesn't really mean a lot. It's, it's opening the door. What means a lot is having a partner who owns that intellectual property that licenses it to you and gives you a technology and, and knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer is critical. Um, it, it saves you a lot of time and you probably won't figure out things if you just get given the IP alone without the technology skills and knowledge transfers. And that was a model that manifested the early 2000s. It, um, it progressed to what we eventually call a license uh, technology transfer, um, manufacturing and distribution agreements. And that is a model that we used later on to transition into multi-drug resistant TB with two very old aminoglycoside anti antimicrobials called cycloserin and capriomycin. It was the genesis of aspirin going into, uh, into sterols because capriomycin requires a very specialized freeze-dried lyophilization technology, and it allowed us that opportunity to get into sterols for the first time and also to solve a pandemic. But in all of this, the commercial opportunity started arising. And we said, well, if we're in sterols with lyophilization, surely 
there's other opportunities. And before we knew it, we knew it because we got FDA approvals through a PEPFAR expedited review program. All of a sudden, we landed a contract to manufacture 35 million units of what is the second and fourth most popular over-the-counter eye drop brand in the United States, Murine Eye Drops and, and uh, Clear Eyes. Now, eye drops require sterile capability. So we had the sterile capability. So we kind of started building on our manufacturing expertise and speciality. And at the same time, we started developing through a number of, um, I think what were smart acquisitions, we started developing a global footprint. And in so doing, in parallel, we were developing uh, all the time and moving up the value chain in our manufacturing. And at the same time, growing our global footprint so that you've got volume and economies of scale. So that was very much the business model. So you're able to meet your commercial objectives, but also responding to two pandemics on the continent. Now, if you don't respond to these pandemics, you're not going to have health security, and health security causes a whole lot of other instability and problems. I don't have to tell anyone or remind anyone on this platform. I'm just trying to demonstrate what you can do during the time of pandemics and at the same time build a business. Because the one thing we keep hearing repetitively is that Africa cannot do it. They, have to, they don't have the skills, they don't have the know-how. And what's even worse, colleagues, I'm afraid to say is that there is an element of Afro-pessimism within our own midst, which is, um, which is a little sad because you would hope that uh, you know, uh, Africans would express confidence in their own brands and I detect that is starting to change now. As I said, these winds of change are blowing over Africa. Let me continue with this issue of how do you build a world-class capacity out of Africa that solves not only African problems, but presents an export opportunity. Now, the thing about an export opportunity is, is critical because we know that manufacturing and sustaining local capacities on the continent is all about having volume throughput. If you don't have volume, you don't get the recoveries in your plant, your plants are unsustainable. You have to shut them down eventually. You either downsize or you shut them down completely. And I'm afraid to say that uh, Africa is a wasteland. And I don't use the word lightly. We're a wasteland of many pharmaceutical manufacturing plants. You can go through many African countries and you'll see that this plant was mothballed, it was built by the Belgians, or whatever it is. So we, we haven't looked after our manufacturing assets on the continent because we haven't created an enabling environment to have this volume, these sustainable volumes that we need to build sustainable factories and to keep the local capacity on the continent. Instead, what we've done is we've taken a very short-term view of the market. So we say, well, we need a plant and there's not a year that goes by, like I said yesterday, where there isn't a new African pharmaceutical plan on the table. And these plans are all fantastic, but we never implement those plans. And then we wonder why we keep importing more and more. And we do that for two reasons. Firstly, because we take a very short term view. So we say we've got a plan, but then the next importer flies in and says, well, you know what, uh, here's our product offering. And then we start importing the products again. So we never get ahead of the game when it comes to local manufacturing. The consequences are, that the continent is uh, disfigured. I'm also saying that it is, it's disfigured by having very little pharmaceutical industrial uh, activity, very little value added manufacturing. And we are, as I said earlier, serial and chronic importer with a massive uh, pharmaceutical trade deficit. Now these deficits are not good at any time least of all when you've got or are managing a pandemic. These deficits have to be funded in hard currency and they give you very little flexibility around managing your own security of supply. So that's the single biggest change we need to uh, 
take advantage of now in this new environment, these uh, winds of change blowing over, is this is the time to reverse what is a very damaging trade deficit, pharmaceutical trade deficit to the continent. So let me fast track a little, because I'm trying to use the Aspen example to demonstrate, as I keep saying, how can you get to this global world-class business that uh, solves your own problems on the continent? And I'm not saying we've done everything right at Aspen, but I, I think it's always an interesting case study, and I'm really just imparting you to the case study, and hopefully this will be thought-provoking and stimulate many other entrepreneurs to look at things on, on a similar basis. So part of building our global footprint, as I said earlier, depended on, on, on a number of smart transactions. And through one of these transactions, in fact, two of them, we were able to uh, enter the anesthetics business. Uh, this is general, regional, tropical, and to a much smaller degree, transdermal uh, anesthesia. Anesthetics, as you know, are much sought after products. There are not a lot of uh, manufacturers for, for uh, anesthetics. They are sterile emulsions. They are difficult technologies. And not uh, that technology is not available on the continent. So we built up this uh, anesthetic business. And before we knew it, we were the largest supply of general anesthetics in the world outside of America. And uh, there were two tracks, as I keep saying, there was your manufacturing assets and moving up the value chain. And I indicated that we started moving up into sterols and we made further investments into sterols. And this expanded both our capability and capacity in sterols. So we became a pan-African sterile platform for the world now, that's where we are. And in that platform and at our flagship manufacturing facility, which is in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, by the way, we have 26 factories around the world. Three of those, sorry, eight of those are based in South Africa and the rest are based in Europe, uh, East Africa, but something in West Africa, Mexico, uh, Australia and, uh, and, and Brazil, to give you an idea. And um, what, what we... What, what we looked at through the sterile capacity, which is in the Eastern Cape, as I said, is how do you leverage that capacity um, into other more diverse areas other than just general anesthetics? And like I said yesterday, uh, we had built the sterile capability, the expanded sterile capability for general anesthetics. And the Eastern Cape now is uh, one of the largest and most important manufacturing hubs for general anesthetics anywhere in the world. So when people say Africans can't do it, you don't have the skills. Well, I think this is a demonstrable example where we are supplying product and it's complex product to manufacture out of South Africa to the rest of the world. So Europe gets these products. And in fact, um, on the onset of the, uh, the first wave of COVID pandemic, you will all recall some pretty harrowing visuals on TV coming out of Italy and France and Spain and other continental European countries where patients could not be uh, ventilated. And we supplied these uh, muscle relaxants and general anesthetics for these patients. So we kind of reversed the roles here. Here was an African company now supplying much life-saving critical medicines to Europe. Usually it's the other way around. So my only point I'm trying to make here is that Africans can do it. We've got the skills on the continent. We just need to harvest and harness those skills. And this is what we've done. So I think not a bad position to be in where you've got an African company now supplying the world with uh, something as critical and as complex to make as general anesthetics. Let me start winding down because I know we've got to allow some time for questions. So when um, the pandemic broke in January, February last year, we obviously looked at our sterile and other capabilities. We don't only have sterile capabilities, of course, as I've alluded to. We had a look at this and said, well, what else or how else can we respond to this pandemic? We did so with HIV. We did so in, uh, in some way with multi-drug resistant TB. 
how do we play some role here now as well? And obviously, we already started playing a role with the general anesthetics and muscle relaxants for ventilated patients. And coincidentally, the Oxford study on dexamethasone long-acting corticosteroid came out, and dexamethasone still remains for those uh, hospitalized ICU patients with COVID complications. It remains one of the frontline treatments. 35% mortality reduction with those patients. So we realized that we had the original product for dexamethasone. So of course, we were able to respond in that way as well. And we started supplying dexamethasone to, to many countries. The, this is largely the injectable form, but also the tablet form. And we, we still weren't satisfied. And we said, look, we've we got to get into vaccines because that's the future. All these pandemics eventually fizzle out through a combination of things, but at the forefront of this fizzling out is, uh, is, is vaccinations. And we realized that we didn't even have to repurpose or pivot uh, any of our existing capabilities. We were able to manufacture uh, fill and finish vaccine uh, vials at this facility. We got into discussions fairly early on with Johnson & Johnson. I'm not suggesting, again, any crystal gazing uh, superpowers here, but there were options that we could look at. We were comfortable speaking to Johnson & Johnson. We had worked with them previously in HIV. We had a track record with them, and I think for these large R&D-based multinational companies, track record, trust, confidence, capabilities, quality systems, et cetera, are critical. And that, that's why we had these discussions and we picked to partner at a contract manufacturing level with Johnson & Johnson with a view of expanding our capacities on the continent. So very early on, Johnson & Johnson indicated that they would need a capacity of 1 billion doses uh, in, in this calendar cycle that we're in. They only had some of that capacity to fill and finish. They were looking for partners. They reviewed 120 partners globally, and they eventually settled on 10 contract manufacturers. I'm pleased to tell you that Aspen is one of those 10. Um, we are the only ones on the African continent selected and the only ones in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, that is a vote of confidence in Africa's science, in Africa's capabilities, because Johnson & Johnson, I don't need to remind anyone, um, has significant global influence in healthcare. Uh, to put it in perspective, Johnson & Johnson's market capitalization is one and a half times, um, one and a half times the size of South Africa's GDP, just to put it in perspective. So they're not easy companies to deal with. There's massive expectations. And I'm pleased to say an African company met those expectations. We contract manufactured. We've produced over 120 million doses of Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. It is the preferred vaccine on the continent. And 92% of what we have produced has gone into Africa. So this is a demonstrable example of how you can use uh, partnerships, um, manufacturing ex expertise uh, to A, help solve a pandemic, and B, to build local capacity to solve local problems so you don't continue living in this cloud of vaccine inequality and, uh, and uneven distribution that we are experiencing. Now, that's allowed us to go to the next level. Now, what is the next level? The next level is last week we announced a groundbreaking, uh, what I consider to be massive game change on the continent, a licensing agreement between Johnson & Johnson and Aspen, where Aspen will acquire the licensing rights and produce its own vaccine, an African vaccine, which will be called Aspenovax. That's a a significant development for the continent because it means now that Aspen controls both the allocation and distribution 
of the vaccine. So it will only go into Africa. The rights we've secured are only for Africa. So we can't be in a position where you contract manufacture, but don't own the stock and 50% of it could go somewhere else outside of Africa. In the meantime, you need 100% in Africa. So I must commend Johnson & Johnson on the one hand, because they've had the vision to license the product to an African producer who will now produce for the continent. But in, um, in, in the next breath, I should also say that this now allows Africa to have its own vaccine. Let me end off with two other very important components to this whole conversation. I keep indicating repeatedly that we are a continent that is known for our wildlife and we are a continent that is known for African elephants. Okay. What we don't need is white elephants. Right? So we don't want to put up these facilities and they become white elephants. Okay. I'd rather stick to the gray African elephants that we know. Um, white elephants are going to put us right back in the position where we are or where we were a year ago. And uh, when the next pandemic comes around, we're going to be in the same position, which is untenable, unacceptable. <laughs> so how do we keep these facilities going? Arguably, for me, the most important thing Africa needs to deal with right now, if we're saying that vaccines are, uh, are, are the quickest way to, um, vac if vaccines are the quickest way uh, to economic recovery, and dealing with the, uh, with, with the public health crisis that we're dealing with. If that is true, then uh, we need to make sure that the multilateral procurement agencies, the donor fund agencies, all of these agencies start procuring from African facilities. If they do not do that, then I'm afraid we will have these white elephants rather than the African elephants. So what is this, for me, one of the single most important actions here right now? That is that we need to make certain that Africa's needs are procured through African manufacturers. We sustain these factories and we build on them so that we start addressing other therapeutic areas and other public health challenges that we have on the continent. Exceedingly important. Now, let me raise a final issue, which segues into um, or, 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 or the procurement piece segues into the next issue. The next issue is how does Africa come together and aggregate its volumes? So this is the cardinal sin that we've committed as Africans because what we've done is we've got these massive volumes, 1.3 billion people, nearly 1.4 that live on our continent. What we've done is, however, we've outsourced our entire volume to Europe and India and other places, China, they've benefited from our volumes. They create jobs in their countries. They get the benefits of the tax and all the other up and downstream activities. It doesn't seem right, as I said. It's like, a, you know, you're the biggest, uh, you've got the most drivers on the road, but you're importing all your cars. How can that be? And it's a very similar situation. So, the African Free Trade Continental Agreement, and most importantly, what the, Af what the African Union has done, which President Ramaphosa started, Strav Masiwa in his capacity as head of ABET, Professor Arama, African Bank in Egypt, the deputy head of, of ABET, what they have done is for the first time they've started aggregating these volumes. And aggregating these volumes we now have leverage on the continent. We can now go to these procurement agencies, and the donor fund agencies who are well-intentioned, but as well-intentioned as they've been, they have been the single biggest cause of deindustrializing our continent from a pharmaceutical point of view. It's again, you know, sometimes these well-intentioned things have unintended consequences. This is a classic example of that. So what do we need to do here? We need to keep aggregating these volumes African Free Trade Continental Agreement and the likes, and in particular, the Abbott platform really gives me a lot of hope and we need to expand Abbott, not just to include a uh, COVID vaccine, we need to expand it beyond that. So you develop further uh, capability, capacity, and, uh, and, and value chains and linkages on the continent. 
Implicit in what I've just said, of course, is that you do need regulatory harmonization on the continent. And we right now are 55 countries on the continent. We certainly not, uh, some people perceive us to be a homogeneous market, we're not. We're very much a heterogeneous market. Each market is characterized by the undefined characteristics. Uh, and of course, one of the single biggest barriers to market to access speed or market to access and, um, and, and uh, market, uh, market shaping very often is how you deal with the regulatory aspects. And we, we do need, and I'm pleased to say that Michelle Sadiba is driving this initiative on the continent. I, I don't know Hiteshi if he was part of this. I think he was part of yesterday's discussions. Don't know. I, I so wish you were here listening to me. Um, but this regional harmonization is, is very critical to achieving the end game. So what is the end game? The end game is that we need local capacities to solve local public uh, health uh, problems and challenges. We need to look at pharmaceuticals, not as a begging bowl as we've done in the past. We need to look at it as an industrial opportunity for the continent that creates self-sufficiency, security, self-sufficiency, security of supply, and also rightfully enables economic activity on the continent. We cannot continue outsourcing our volumes to others who benefit economically at the deficit of our own continent. We should become a continent that has our own local production. And instead of exporting jobs, we export products and we keep the taxes from our own endeavors on the continent. I hope I've given you some semblance of how Aspen arrived at that point. It's been quite an interesting journey and a journey with uh, right now that uh, is on the cusp of a new chapter. And that new chapter is um, we need to get these multilateral agencies, our own governments on the continent to procure locally so we have sustainability in volumes and uh, sustain manufacturing capacity on the continent. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. I'll hand over to Hitesh. And Hitesh, I'm going to check the chat group while you're doing this. Thanks. Thank you, Stavros. Uh, excellent discussion presentation and uh, really commendable what Aspen has done to secure Africa's global health uh, security. I, I want to say we're not there yet, but fantastic and phenomenal work. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to pick up was, uh, you know, that we, we need to move away from the narrative that Africans cannot do it. I think it's very important that we all speak here collectively about our capabilities to, to move forward in this space. But one thing you said is, uh, and I, I think Ravi has given us about two to three minutes to, to talk, so I'll, I'll pose one question through to you. You, well, firstly, you said you haven't done everything right at Aspen, but you've done many things right. And I think it's very impressive, again, uh, regarding your response to, to, to COVID-19. Um, a point you also brought up was, uh, and, and, and a word you said early on was, was, was a wasteland. And, and, and I want to ask you uh, about that. You know, there's a lot of discussion now about local manufacturing of vaccines in Africa. In your opinion, and looking at a macro level um, across the various regions in Africa, what do governments need to do to make the environment more conducive uh, for, to attract manufacturing? Uh, I, I think that for me is, 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 is a bit blurry, but if you can shed some light on as to what Aspen has done, how the South African government enabled you and what other governments in Africa need to do to enable other manufacturers so that we don't end up with this wasteland of, of manufacturing facilities. Maybe if we can talk, talk to that and then uh, and, uh, we can take it from there. Thank you. Okay, so what, what is it that governments can do? I think there, there are many things, but I'll focus on three. Um, firstly, not, not everyone can put up a plant in Africa, right? I think we've got to play to our respective strengths and complementarities. Um, what you're better off doing is having a, a few select manufacturers and then cooperating or collaborating at a distribution network level. I think that's the first thing. There's got to be that realization. Um, 
And I say that because if you start diluting the volumes, and, and I, I keep saying not everyone can get into this business, right? It's not an easy business. It's taken Aspen a good 15 years to get to this point. Uh, it's not just the skills, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the capabilities you build over a period of time. So I think the first thing that governments need to do is they need to walk the talk and implement on these localization plans. So um, we, we hear most governments on the continent talking about localization, and it's the right thing to do. But in practice, what happens is that there's very little implementation, as I said. So that's the first thing. Governments need to walk the talk. They, they need the courage of their conviction. There's obviously short-term deficits here, and there's pain that you're going to take initially with anything you buy. But you've got to look at the long-term benefits. And I feel that we've been too short-termist in our outlook with these localization policies. Uh, the second thing is the, the, the point that I keep beating the drum of buying locally. And um, governments on the continent need to support this aggregated procurement approach on the continent where you combine the volumes. You know, when you go and deal individually as a country, I don't know you go in this Botswana or South Africa, wherever it is, okay, individually, your volumes are not attractive. Uh, so whether you're dealing with a donor fund agency, a multilateral procurement agency, a manufacturer or a supplier, the volumes are not that interesting because you're up against 300 million Americans or a, a, a billion point four uh, Chinese or whatever it is. But suddenly, if you aggregate the volumes and you go in and say, well, you know what, you've got volumes for 1.3 people, 1.3 billion people, and you know what, we've actually got the funding, makes a very, very different discussion play out. But we've got to make sure our governments who sit on these multi, whether they sit at Gabby, United Nations, World Bank, wherever, those donors, we've got to impress upon them, listen, great that you're giving us funding, but all you're doing is you're giving that back to your own companies. We want it to come to our own companies. Yeah, so that's number two that we can do. Number three, you need in those countries where you're going to have plants, you need a customized and tailored uh, in incentive arrangement to attract investors on the continent. Now, or in the particular country. Now, investors want off takes. No one's going to go and put up a $200 million facility if they know that in two years' time, the volumes are all going to disappear, right? They need sustainability of the volumes. And that we've got to get into this mindset with the $1.3 billion volume leverage that we will look to give off takes to, to African manufacturers so that we can attract investment and jobs, multiply effect, up and down stream of activities and value chain creation linkages on the continent. We need a conducive environment for investors. So Hitesh, those are the three of many things that they could be doing. Dervas, thank you very much. I want to echo that and, uh, and also uh, support the work you're doing. And we hope to have you back here at the GHSC to speak again on your progress on providing vaccines into Africa. We're going to watch that very closely. So again, on behalf of the GHSC Summit, uh, great many thanks.